Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, gr great to be here and uh, enjoy the uh, opening re remarks very much. So let me first uh, express my gratitude to Professor Richard and Professor Prosart for having me here, this very important event. So it, it, ri it is indeed a very important event. Uh, two things that I think they are worth celebrating. One is the 25th anniversary of this fantastic university. And it was born out of a vision, and I'm so glad that I was, I was, I was part of that. Uh, this, is a, this is an old photo uh, I found uh, in my archives uh, well, as, I was, as I was getting ready for this trip. And uh, you can see that some people don't change much. Uh, this, is, this dates back to at least 20 years, this picture. And this is part of the uh, Four Canadian University Consortium that took part in this, in the development of this magnif magnif magnificent university. And I think coming back here many years after and see how this university has flourished after a vision that was, uh, that was initiated by Professor Vichet and then it's now a world-renowned uh, university. In such a short time, 20, 25 years, it has accomplished so many things. So this alone requires a significant celebration. So I again applaud the organizers for putting this event together and having me here. It, it brings a lot of memories and emotions back, so thanks again. Number two, of course, uh, the topic that we're going to discuss is the generally the role of universities to begin with, and then from there on, what are the specific roles and responsibilities and duties of science and technology universities, and is there a difference in between the two general? Probably not, but if you, if you drill down, you will see some focus-based differences and like to talk about those. So my talk here this morning, I'm going to try to approach it from a more broader perspective and to really understand what it is all about, what it is that we are doing here, what it is that we are promising a better world to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of young minds that come and study at our institutions, come and do your scholarship at our institutions because not only are we offering you a better future, we are counting on you for our future and in that perspective, what are, what are our roles? And to be able to really understand this, we need to really better understand the world in which we exist. So this is how I'm going to start from a general perspective and then we can come to more specific issues. The whole objective is at the end uh, to, to give you some uh, thought provokers that uh, will, 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 will create some discussion, I hope. So, if you go back to the uh, World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, uh, and uh, the, one of the uh, key um, outcomes of this, that is now described, the world in which we live in is described as a very complex, more complex than it ever was. It is more interdependent for various reasons, okay? And also, it's more interconnected than any other times in, in human history. These are significant observations, the complexity, complexity, interdependency, and interconnection. This, of course, presents enormous challenges, but at the same time, what are the challenges, of course, if there are no opportunities that will go with those challenges? So the successful organizations, not just universities, but such successful organizations will understand these challenges will also understand and seize upon the opportunities that are almost go, that almost go in parallel with these challenges and build a risk resilience without which, again, I don't think that we could talk about comfortably about innovation and innovative environment at our institutions. So why? Why is our world quite a bit different from what it was 20 years ago and then 25 years ago, and you compare that time with 25 years before, it was the degree of complexity wasn't as much. So what is accelerating this complexity? What is accelerating the change? Well, we've seen things that we've never ever seen in human history before. The uh, 
explosive growth and accessibility of information. Information is now available to anybody, at any time, any part of the world. This is a significant change that you don't have to wait for weeks to have access to a piece of information. You don't have to be living in a privileged country or be near to a inf source of that information. You can have access to that information regardless of who you are, where you live, and when you need it. That information is available. This is a significant, significant change that many of us still have not come to a full realization. Number two, believe it or not, uh, you go back, uh, including myself, uh, I, uh, I was quite comfortable where, we, where I was in terms of my social standards, but I needed a better research environment to fulfill my research ambitions, so I moved from one place to another one. At that time, again, that ability was in the hands of just a you know, handful of uh, countries or organizations. Now we will see, we're seeing that increasing number of highly skilled workforce engaged in research and development in many, many parts of the world. This is, again, a significant change. And thirdly, many more countries, including Thailand, including India or Brazil or, you know, many countries, many more countries than existed before, they are ca capable of conducting significant research and cutting edge development. So these are some very, very important developments that the world had never seen before. At the same time, I'm sorry, this is not very visible. In my slides, it was fine, but there must be a compatibility. I can't even read it from here. Uh, so what is this? This comes from, again, the World Economic Forum. And this is the risk map of our world. Simply, uh, the vertical axis is the likelihood of impact of this risk. And uh, 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 this is the impact, and this is the likelihood, possibility of happening. As I'm standing here, if there's one mosquito in this room, what's the likelihood of this mosquito biting me, and what will be the impact? So the likelihood will probably be very small, but <coughs> impact will be very high. So they went through thousands of factors, risk factors, and came up with this global risk map. Why am I showing you this? We cannot be responsible leaders of our educational institutions and not be aware of what it is that our students should be aware. As I, as I said in the beginning of my talk, we are not just interested in the kind of education they will get. What we are more interested in, what kind of leaders these students will become, what kind of changes they will bring what kind of world, the better world, that they will be able to participate based on their education. And their education cannot be isolated from the facts of the world in which we live in. If you look at this, of course, this quadrant will be the most critical one because the likelihood of this risk happening and its high impact, they all go together. Here, this is unemployment or un underemployment of youth. The world recognizes what a great risk that will create if our university graduates are not finding employment or they are not finding proper employment related to their field of study. It's a big risk and the numbers are staggering. And environment is somewhere here. Uh, all kinds of things are here. I hope when you get the actual uh, document, you'll be able to see it better. So then when we are thinking about the focus that uh, Professor Richard so eloquently described that we need to focus on, our focus will have to be informed by these risks, but at the same time, what kind of opportunities would risks, again, will create both social opportunities as well as economic opportunities for our institutions or for our countries. Implications. If I distill this risk map down, you will see that number one implication will be, I highlighted here, will be education. 
Number two is healthcare and long-term care. Healthcare is the healthcare aspect of every living being, but especially given our aging population, given the changing demographics, change, given the uh, nature of our cultural practices, long-term care will become even a more global, important global issue. If I could expand on this just for uh, two, second, uh, uh, two minutes, traditionally, if you look at generation before us, younger generation took care of the uh, older generation. It is getting more and more and more difficult because of various reasons I won't get into it. But what if you're talking about a long-term care policy that enables people to age gracefully, so you won't have to be a burden on the healthcare system all the time as you're aging. You are enabled to age gracefully and healthily. And more importantly, you live gracefully and healthy after you have age. Again, with a minimal amount of burden on the healthcare system. Because at the end of the day, everything said and done, education, all, of, all th other things, the number one cost to every economy in the world is healthcare. And it will keep growing unless there is an innovation there to ensure that that burden on the healthcare is minimized or optimized and some of those resources are rightfully expended on other places like education. Furthermore, financial systems, commodities, agri-food or water will become unbelievably important, big challenges, and we talked about environment. We did mention uh, the environment. We will not be enjoying the generations to come, or we can even think about them, if we, are not, we don't really understand what climate change is, what, what is, what climate change adaptation is. We're not going to go into uh, some, the, some disputable issues, but nevertheless, climate change is factual regardless of how it or where it comes from, and the role of clean technology is everybody's responsibility. So in a short, like these uh, five elements, they are the ones that will determine what our impact should be in this, in this changing world. So what do we do? If we were to start uh, thinking about a long-term strategy as to how do we prepare ourselves? I am sure that my colleagues here and elsewhere, we're not interested in taking charge of organizations and moving them along the same way as they were. It will be so boring and uninspiring. What we are charged to do is what kind of strategy, what kind of vision can we further bring on the institutions that will be fully equipped and armed to be able to uh, handle these challenges. A vibrant research environment is one of the most important aspects, without which, if we are not curious, if we are not able to better and further understand everything that we think we understand, we may as well pack up and leave because somebody else will be far ahead of us that will make everything else we do here currently is in insignificant. To accomplish that, to, to, to attach to that, the world word innovation, and uh, Professor Rich used it several times very appropriately, is a must. I will tell you very clearly here that if you think that you are right now for whatever you're doing in a very good position, Actually, let's uh, upgrade it to excellent position in where you are. Don't even think one second about sitting on it and enjoying it. Status quo is the most dangerous position to be in. You cannot enjoy your status quo. You have to move on. You have to bring innovation in. Because the moment you set back and say, wow, what a great place we are, what a great thing we have, somebody else will come and pass you. Your great thing will be the great thing of the past, but not of the future. For that to be the great thing of the future, 
you have to constantly, constantly innovate. And innovation do, should not happen. Well, we've been doing this for four years now. It's time for us to sit down and start you know, thinking about innovation. No, innovation has to be a dynamic constitution.